Jonathan Badin had just gotten out of the shower and was trying to clear the fog from the bathroom mirror. He swiped his hand across the mirror first one way, then as the fog began to creep back in, he swiped his hand the other way. Seeing his face there on the small swatch of exposed reflective surface, it hit him that this swiping motion might be the solution to a problem that he was facing at work. Badin was the chief strategy officer at a fledgling dating app company called Tinder, and at the time, he was trying to figure out how to allow app users to more intuitively navigate through all the information that the app would present to them about potential matches. They'd settled on a user interface that looked something like a stack of cards, with the information for each person truncated so that it fit cleanly on an individual card, allowing you to see everything about a potential match all at once on a smartphone screen. But the mechanisms they'd tried for shuffling through those cards had not really worked as well as they had hoped. Nothing seemed quite right. This story of how the now common swipe navigation method came to be very well might be apocryphal, kind of a convenient creation myth for what was actually the consequence of a dozen user interface developers working together and iterating this concept over time. The world of business is full of such stories because they help reinforce the brand and because it makes for a more compelling and memorable story to tell the press than the boring tale of a group of people iterating something in a more standard and forgettable way. Whatever the case may be, though, the swipe changed everything, or at least this specific use case for it did. Swipe-based user interfaces already existed within other apps back in 2012, when Tinder first became available as the newest of many smartphone-based dating services. But for this particular scenario, swiping through a seemingly endless collection of potential matches, it proved to be especially viscerally satisfying. And it was a user interface decision that aligned well with other choices that they made in an attempt to make dating apps less cumbersome, less of a chore, and more of a laid-back, almost impulsive decision. They were an enthusiastic adopter of Facebook's Connect service, which is perhaps more commonly known to non-developers as Login with Facebook. This made the process of signing up for new accounts much simpler and allowed them to auto-populate photos and other information pulled from the user's Facebook account. This also allowed them to show common connections between swiper and swipee, which helped make potential matches seem less like strangers from the internet. They later integrated with Instagram and Spotify as well, allowing for more data to be collected and for profiles to become a little more fleshed out without requiring any additional effort from the user. Using a double opt-in system for matches helped generate interest early on, too. Rather than allowing anyone to message anyone, a situation that made many traditional dating sites unfriendly to women in particular, as they could be swamped with messages from randos all day, you could only message someone who you had swiped right on, meaning you had liked them, and who, importantly, had also swiped right on you, meaning that they liked you. Going mobile first was another choice that proved to be fortuitous, as it allowed them to focus on a burgeoning market of, on average, younger and more casual daters, and which, especially at first, ensured that their app worked better on smartphones than most of their competitors' services, many of which were browser-first, meaning they were built for computer screens and scaled down for phones. So even Tinder's better-funded and more entrenched competitors were at a disadvantage in the mobile space. It's important to note that although Tinder was technically competing with Match.com and other such services from day one, it was also developed by IAC, a massive holding company that owns over 150 brands, including a collection of brands called the Match Group, which today includes Match.com, Chemistry.com, How About We, OkCupid, okay Plenty of Fish, BlackPeopleMeet.com, Two with two O's, Friend Scout 24, and yes, Tinder, among others. 
Just last month, in June of 2018, IAC added another popular dating app to their portfolio called Hinge, which is a service that actually goes in a somewhat different direction from Tinder, opting for a more involved curated dating experience over the quick twitch abundance that many dating apps opt for today. The only notable major and majorly popular dating app that is not owned by this group, Bumble, was started by Whitney Wolf, who was one of the co-founders of Tinder, but who left mid-2014, following what she claims was a culture of sexual harassment and discrimination within the company. There was a $1 million settlement in her favor, and later that year she started Bumble in an attempt to solve some of the problems that she perceived within the world of Tinder and Tinder clones, putting more power in the hands of women when it comes to heterosexual interactions on the app in particular. At the moment, at least, Bumble is still flying solo and hasn't been gobbled up by the match group beast that has eaten the rest of the online dating world. There are countless other dating apps available in the iOS and Android app stores, of course, but none of them seem to have reached the network effect critical mass necessary to make such an app popular. Even if they have a good idea that sets them apart from the rest of the pack, if there isn't anyone else using the app with who to interact, chances are small that anyone will stick around and keep using it. What I want to talk about today is modern dating, and particularly the influence technologies like dating apps have had on our perception of what's normal and what we can and should expect from the world of dating and from relationships. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show, and if you are enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. You can also contribute via PayPal or Venmo, and you can find links for that at letsknowthings.com. Your non-monetary support is also quite helpful, leaving a quick review wherever you get your podcasts or sharing the podcast with a friend or with your social network of choice. And if you're keen to come out and hear me speak live to get a hug or a handshake, maybe get a book signed, you can find details about my upcoming tour at becomingtour.com. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from Hyperallergic, and it's entitled... The Gamification of Intimacy Through Dating Sims. This piece gives an overview of a few of the virtual reality and augmented reality-based dating simulation games that are currently quite popular amongst certain demographics, particularly in Japan. But it also touches on a few other points that I think deserve additional attention, so I'm going to divide this discussion up into three main sections. The first is what these sims are like and what the consequences of their existence seem to be in Japan, where they are currently quite in vogue. The second is how technology as a whole seems to be influencing dating and relationships and our expectations about both. And the third is where things may be going in this space based on the evolution of these technologies, but also other interconnected changes that are happening around the world and throughout society. Let's start with a definition for a term that is mentioned in the headline of that article. Gamification is the application of game-like principles and reward systems to non-game settings with the intent of increasing the desirability or maintainability of a particular behavior, increasing engagement or learning behaviors, and potentially increasing the ease of use or utility of something as well. So in general, it's about making non-game things seem game-like in order to make them more addictive. In some cases, this strategy is used to reinforce positive habits and behaviors. If you have a fitness tracker or some other system that gives you points for working out or eating healthily, or which counts your steps or gives you badges for completing your homework or other tasks, that's gamification. If you're presented with a little video or collection of photographs from last year by a social network to reward you for staying on their platform, that's gamification. 
If you're given points for buying things, which you can then exchange for free stuff or status upgrades later, that's gamification. We see gamification all over the place in the modern world, in part because it's proven to be so reliable in increasing user and customer retention when it comes to selling goods and services, for building brand loyalty, for increasing interactions with a given company, and because it can shape a person's life in countless invisible ways. Gamification has proven to be so useful for political purposes that websites affiliated with terrorist activities, like the white nationalist site Stormfront, utilize reputation scores to keep their users interacting with their platform in a way that is useful for them and for their growth. So this goes beyond incentivizing healthy eating and buying things from a particular store. It can also incentivize, for instance, spreading disinformation or harassing or doxing people. It should be no surprise, then, that gamification methods are used within the world of dating as well. And although they're certainly being used by dating apps like Tinder, one of the more meta and potentially worrisome use cases for this gamification strategy is inside of games. But specifically, games that are oriented around dating. So not apps for dating that help you get a date in the real world, but immersive dating simulators where you attempt to get a date or get a kiss or get laid within the simulated world of a virtual reality or augmented reality system. Dating sims of this kind are not hugely popular in the US or Europe compared to their immense popularity in Japan, but they are popular within certain subcultures. And variations on these games, like the wildly popular game The Sims, have struck a chord with worldwide audiences over the years. The big difference between a general simulation type game and a dating sim game, though, is that in the latter, the goals are all oriented toward a very specific outcome. You play the role of a person interacting with another person or other people, and most or all of these people are potentially dateable, kissable, sexable, virtual entities. The nature of the game component varies, but in most cases, you are tasked with figuring out the correct responses to things that your in-game love interest says or does, either choosing from a collection of finite pre-written options, or you interact with them and the environment in some way, clicking on things or moving your hands in a virtual environment, things like that. The sophistication of the AI, the software responses to your actions, within these games varies substantially, as does the complexity of options available for interaction. In some cases, these games are a little more than virtual reality-based choose-your-own-adventures that will sometimes result in flashes of virtual legs or breasts, and in some cases it's more like a Tamagotchi or Farmville where your relationship depends on continuous maintenance over time, and if you fail to read a facial expression correctly, or read between the lines in something that your virtual girlfriend says, or if you fail to give her the right gift, you may find yourself with a virtual ex, the equivalent of a dead virtual pet. These sorts of games have been around in various forms for decades, but they became more complex and more addictive about a decade ago when portable versions playable on the Nintendo DS and other relatively high-end gaming consoles became available. This led to a flurry of men marrying their video games panic pieces in the news, and although there have been some extreme cases of so-called otaku, which is a term generally reserved for young men in Japan who have atrophied social skills and an over-the-top enthusiasm for computers, geeky pop culture, and video games, there have been rare cases of these otaku trying to marry their virtual girlfriends, or declaring that they could never date a real woman because they wouldn't understand them the way their pixelated girlfriends understand them. But beyond those rare instances, much of this panic is just that, panic. Now there was a timing alignment between that specific, oh my god, our boys are not interested in women anymore, moral panic, and the emergence of modern dating simulation video games. But the other probably more vital correlation here is the coinciding panic about Japan's low birth rate, which is below the necessary replacement rate, meaning more people are dying than are being born, which is driving the country steadily toward a geriatric bubble wherein there will not be enough young people to keep society running steadily and to take care of all of the old people. Now this latter issue about the geriatric bubble is probably quite real 
it's probably a real concern, and it would be more than a little bit worrying for any government that wants to maintain a healthy status quo based on previous trends and expectations. Staying a bit above the replacement rate so that the population is steadily growing just a little bit each year is generally considered to be ideal for the maintenance of predictable economic output. So it makes sense that the Japanese government would try to stimulate a little more baby-making amongst their young people once they had that data available. And a moral panic about kids being more interested in video games than dating is one way to approach that. But 20 and 30-somethings in Japan are notoriously lax in the dating department. And that laxity goes beyond just having babies. The current truism is that young men in Japan, in particular, have become less romantic and willing to sacrifice for their families. Because it's just easier to sit at home and play video games and geek out about nerd stuff and to have their latent desire for companionship fulfilled by their in-game girlfriends. At the same time, young women are being blamed for entering the workforce and building their own lives, independent of boyfriends, rather than marrying young and having babies and managing the home, like their parents are more likely to do, on average. This is a compelling narrative, especially for older generations, that will always, no matter the specific circumstances and no matter the generation we're talking about, worry over and look down upon, in some ways, the choices younger generations make. And that's true in any culture, and has been true, to varying degrees, since the beginning of time. Because of the evolution of morality and society, by the time you're a hundred years old, the world will have changed sufficiently so that the decisions that 20-year-olds make and the priorities that they have will almost certainly seem foreign to you. And that's arguably a good thing. It means that we are making moral and social progress. At the same time, though, it can also color situations in which there are real, potentially addressable problems looming on the horizon. And it can set the scene in such a way that it's difficult to tell what the real issues are and how we might come up with solutions to those actual issues. In this case, it's been, I think, compellingly argued that the real issue stems from the conflict between economic reality and cultural expectation. In Japan, tradition dictates that the man is the breadwinner and the economic support system for the family, and that women should be a bit more submissive, have children, and stay at home, keeping that side of things in order. The business world has changed, though, so that jobs that pay enough to support a family are in shorter supply, and are very seldom available to young people. So the idea of being a young man in his 20s or even his 30s, and being able to find work that will pay enough to support a family, that's become a bit of a pipe dream. At the same time, the reality of women getting jobs and supporting themselves, having their own lives, has curtailed the potential for that traditional setup even further. It's given women more options to choose from, and men who are often brought up with a certain conception of how things are supposed to be, and how worthless they are as human beings if they fail to live up to that standard, they're maybe left a little bit befuddled and seeking out any potential easy victories. It's possible, of course, that work could be done to adjust those economic realities and or adjust those social expectations. But in any culture, both tend to be glacially slow to adjust, even if they've already changed in practice. It's difficult to change our perception of things, even if the world around us has already changed. So that gap between expectation and potential is likely to remain for some time. And perhaps, at least in part, a consequence of that, the world of dating simulation games are becoming all the more immersive. Relatively cheap, commercially available virtual reality equipment is becoming more attainable by everyday people, and augmented reality software is being built into tablets and phones, ensuring that larger and broader swaths of the population have access to it by default. This is something that would be tricky to measure in any non-anecdotal way, but it seems possible that because of the push in that direction, and because of how these games portray dating as a series of interactions that can be hacked, can be won, if you just know the right code, and because of how they often portray women as idealized aesthetic fantasies, and as very young and generally very naive subservience, it makes sense that elements of this problem could be amplified by that. After all, if you are a young man and your only dating experience, your only regular interactions with women is with virtual women within these sorts of games, 
how might that skew your perception of what dating is and how to properly interact with people, much less people that you're interested in? What long-term consequences might emerge from something like that? Maybe substantial ones, or maybe few, if any. It's hard to say. And I still personally think that much of the issue here is less about games and more about economics and cultural standards, but there's a fair chance that games are maybe adding something to that larger problem either way. Now, I should note here that this is not a trend that is completely limited to heterosexual young men in Japan. There are dating simulation games that are made for and are popular with older men, with young women, and for people within the LGBTQ community. But those are a lot less common and a lot less popular. The majority of consumers for these games, at least at the moment, still seem to be younger men, with older men coming in at second place and everyone else added together as a distant third. So let's talk about how technology is influencing dating and relationships more broadly. I spoke a bit about Tinder in the intro, and I'm going to use them as an example here as well, because there's an actual psychological concept called the Tinder effect, which states that Tinder and other similar dating apps have warped our collective perception when it comes to dating and relationships. According to this theory, because of the successful gamification of the process of finding a potential dating match, the process itself has become an end unto itself, separate from the presumed original end goal. Or said another way, the thrill of the chase, of swiping and judging and ranking people in your head, of imagining possibilities without dealing with the complexities of real-life interaction, and with the inevitable inadequacies of real life compared to fantasy, these apps can be utilized for stimulation and psychological arousal rather than to actually find someone to date. So the dating app process of swiping and tapping and liking becomes the end, not the means to another end. This theory also says that people will often come across differently online than in real life, which can have a distorting effect on how we perceive the difference between the two types of interaction. We might find ourselves interacting in little ways with all kinds of attractive, seemingly compatible people online. But the physical interactions in which we engage may have a far lower success rate, and people are a little less attractive, a little less perfect, because they are less able to prune and curate their image compared to when they're online. And as a result, we could come to prefer these nicely manicured online interactions, because they are, in effect, less real, in the same way that big screen romances and fairy tales are less real. It's also posited that we like the perception that some greater power, some more knowledgeable force, is acting on our behalf. Which in this case means the sophisticated algorithms that toss us endless photos of potential matches. That these higher powers also interact with us in a way that suits our lifestyles, making the whole process ultra-clinical and efficient so that we can swipe for matches while on the bus, or in the waiting room of the doctor's office, or in bed before going to sleep, or while in class, it can make the dating scene feel more friendly to our needs, even as it subtly distorts our needs in a way that aligns with the company's financial priorities. It can make the process an always-on thing, rather than something that healthily balances with the rest of our uninterrupted, tap-free, swipe-free lives. Other theories posit that part of what we find so compelling about these apps and this method of finding potential matches is that it allows us to dip our toes into the water of potentially monumental changes, potentially life-changing interactions and pivots, without ever fully committing to that type of change. And that ability to step back from the precipice, to match with someone, then never send a message, or to ghost someone after a few back and forth messages, or to drop off the network completely mid-conversation with a dozen people, only to emerge again a few months later when we want a little attention. That is theorized to be the root of the popularity of these services. It's not just that we know the potential of the matches that we make, it's that we can expose ourselves to that potential, to those potential paths, to all those new people, without fully acknowledging their humanity in any actionable way. If we met that many people in real life, there would be different social niceties and other people's needs to consider. 
Because of the cold distance enabled by the internet, though, and because of the interfaces of these apps, we can use these services for whatever we need in the moment and then pull away just as quickly, without ever committing to anything, any kind of change, should we choose to use them in that way. There's one more prominent theory that dovetails a bit with the dating simulator component of this story. And the idea here is that by systematizing aspects of the dating life cycle, by removing serendipity from the equation completely, we feel more in control of the process and more capable, in some ways, of bending that process to our will. I had a friend tell me the other day that when he uses dating apps, he just swipes right on everyone, which on these dating apps typically means that you like that person. That's the hack, he told me, so that you can then see everyone who has swiped right on you and then consider all of your options, rather than just seeing the ones that happened to be a match. Another friend once told me, proudly, that he used this never-fail boilerplate message when starting any new conversation on one of these apps. It was a hack that he used to save time, and because, so he claimed at least, it increased his positive outcomes for these messages. He had more people respond to this boilerplate than to any other introduction that he ever used. Another friend of mine, this one a woman, once told me that her trick is taking a cute photo and then sending it to the five or six guys that she's currently chatting with off and on, and keeping those slow burn relationships going at a simmer until she can decide if she actually wants to hook up with or start dating any one of them. These apps allowed her to juggle multiple pseudo relationships efficiently, all of which took very little involvement and investment until one of them began to stand out, at which point she could then either refocus on that one or, if she wanted, pull away from all of them completely. Those Japanese dating simulator games are predicated on the player figuring out the right buttons to push, the right combination of things to say, responding correctly to the flash of an emotion or the hint of an opportunity on a virtual love interest's face. Many people who date, and this has always been true, but it's become a simpler thing to manage and manage on scale today, they're looking for those buttons to push too. They're looking for cheat codes. They're looking for walkthroughs that will tell them exactly how to get what they want out of this situation. And this is why, for women in particular, dating sites can become nightmarish dystopias. Their inbox is flooded with single word messages. The guys on the other end sending that same hey or DTF message to thousands of women. The part of their brain that's looking for the right combination of buttons to push, telling them that if they hey enough women, if they can copy paste the right words to enough strangers, maybe one out of every few hundred will sleep with them. Or maybe even just respond will give them some kind of attention, fulfill some kind of need that they're desperately looking to fulfill, that they're looking for a cheat code to help them accomplish. Different people are on these sites, these apps, for different reasons. But everyone, to some degree or another, is nudged toward optimizing the experience because of the way these triggers and tools can be manipulated and because of human nature. And today, because of the whiz-bang technologies that are built into this process, the convenience factors that have been introduced, we are more capable than ever of turning other people into virtual people. They may be real people with real lives, but to us, through these apps, they are all sort of just non-player characters that we are incentivized to interact with in ways that benefit us. It's like a mainstream, less creepy version of the pickup community, which is full of people who don't understand people trying to refine their behaviors to trick others into giving them what they want. It all reminds me a bit of the game-playing artificial intelligence program that discovered how to beat the high score for the 1980s arcade game Qbert by abusing a bug that it found in the code for the game. Now this AI was meant to be training itself to beat the game by playing it better than any human ever had before, to optimize for play in the sense that humans would do the same, to get better, get faster, find the optimal path through the different levels. But because it was told that the purpose of the game was to achieve a high score, and because that was considered to be the only relevant metric by which success could be achieved, it discovered this software glitch and abused it, achieving millions of points without ever going through the proper motions that most of us would recognize as game playing. It didn't become very good at the game, it became very good at getting a high score. And that's sort of what we're doing with a lot of these platforms. 
these apps have shifted our expectations and understanding of success within the world of dating in real observable ways. To the point where, like that AI playing Qbert, at some point it's almost like we're using the same word, dating, to describe completely different sets of behaviors with completely different goals, even if they maybe track back to some of the same ambitions and biological needs, like the desire for attention and connection and social presentation, a whole lot of how we get there and what it looks like when we arrive would be difficult to recognize as dating in the sense that the word was used a hundred years ago. But all that in mind, let me ask you a question. So what? Norms change. Society shifts. The concept of romantic love, where we choose the person we date, the person we spend our lives with, the person we potentially procreate with, that's still a relatively new concept. And in many cultures today, still, choosing your own partner rather than having that partner chosen for you is a bizarre concept, completely out of line with social and familial expectations. There can, of course, be positive outcomes from any type of arrangement, but the type of dating that has steamrolled over more traditional customs in most societies where it's been introduced, that's new. That's bizarre in the context of relationship history. And yet here it is, considered by many, to be this concrete, ever-present traditional thing. This is the point of dating. This is where it ends up. And anything that is not that... Anything that is not meet somebody, date somebody, marry somebody, have kids, that is weird through the default lens. Part of what's interesting about living today is that so many of us are capable of seeing and hearing about what's happening just over the fence, across the border, or a whole world away. And the more ideas spread, the more capable we become of comparing and contrasting, of imagining alternatives to what we've always known considering how what works somewhere might work here, or why it might not work, but some variation on it that you invent quite possibly could. The model of self-selected romantic love is the dominant structure throughout most of the Western world today, but that model is stratifying, sometimes in obvious ways, as is the case with polyamorous and open relationships, and sometimes in less obvious ways, as is the case with families in which kids have multiple parents due to divorce, remarriage, dating, and adoption. There's also a preponderance of relationships that look superficially similar to the modern traditional model, but which leave the government out of it, opting for a symbolic marriage, or no marriage at all, eternal dating, so that there are no official ties that bind, except for the people involved continuing to want to be with each other. And that, in practice, being the only real deviation from that more typical marriage-dominated model. Long-distance relationships of varying flavors have also increased in popularity of late, in some cases due to practical necessity, and in some cases because the people involved simply don't consider it to be that big a deal. They like having their own space. They like the communication medium of the internet better than the alternatives. There's also been a documented increase in the number of people who form non-sexual lifelong relationships, either because they identify as being asexual or some variation of not interested in sex and most of what comes with sex, or because they have a bond that feels stronger than just a friendship, but which is not romantic. Maybe they want to raise kids together or have a joint household, but they're not interested in each other sexually. So that component of traditional relationships does not come into it. I suspect we will see more variations on these same themes as our technologies continue to evolve and grant us new powers, new opportunities to connect with each other in different ways, and as the world around us changes, as morality continues to evolve, as laws and economic circumstances force a reassessment of priorities, and potentially as, for instance, environmental issues shift. An increase in severe droughts in some regions of the world could result in new living arrangements to account for water scarcity, which could, in turn, lead to new and different models of relationships, families, cohabitation, and so on. And that's true of any major shift of that kind. We may also see, as a consequence of the procreation technology innovation that's happening today, children who are created and incubated and born entirely outside of a human womb, which could, in time, challenge the perception of dating necessarily leading to marriage, which then necessarily leads to having and raising kids together. 
the expectation of certain family models, economic realities, and imbalances created by what was previously a biological necessity, that could shift a lot of things very quickly and dramatically, which again could very well lead to new dating and relationship dynamics. There was a lot of outcry about dating apps when they first hit the scene, but they arguably liberated a lot of communities for whom it was dangerous to date in the more traditional fashion. The LGBTQ community comes to mind in particular as an example of this. It allowed them to connect with each other, meet new people, and to do so in a relatively safe environment, at least safer than before. It very well could be that members of other groups who are today isolated or misunderstood or excluded in some way, could be brought into the larger social fold, granted legitimacy, as these tools develop further. It could be that all of us will have more socially acceptable dating and relationship options, a huge array to choose from in the near future, whether or not we choose to act on any of them. It could also be that the flaws inherent in some of these technologies end up stymieing this progress instead. And we reach a point where instead of hurrying us forward towards some as-of-yet-unknown future, these tools instead force us to take a step back or to the side to wait for the dust to settle a little. It could be that mainstreaming group relationships or the emergence of limited-duration marriages could lead to a period of traditionalism and nostalgia. And maybe tomorrow's hipsters won't favor mason jars and handmade leather goods but instead will opt for traditional two-person marriages with the intent of having a kid or two using a real-deal human womb. No technology necessary. No swiping allowed. If you are in St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, Toronto, New York City, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, or Jacksonville, Florida. I would love to see you at one of my upcoming events. There will be about 20 other cities in addition to these initial ones, but those are the cities for which tickets are already available at becomingtour.com. And in addition to coming to see me speak live, another great way to help support my work is to purchase one of the books that I've written. And you can find a list of those, both fiction and nonfiction, at colin.io. The book that I'd like to recommend today blew my mind completely. It's a relatively short book, and I listened to it as an audiobook, and there were just so many eureka moments where I had to stop the audio and just sit and think about what I'd just heard for five or ten minutes to fully digest it before moving forward. That's something that I do from time to time with a lot of books, but with this book it happened a lot. The title of the book is The Order of Time. The author is Carlo Rovelli. And if you get the audiobook version, the narrator is Benedict Cumberbatch, which, if you know who I'm talking about, he has a voice like a British angel. I would pay to listen to him reading the phone book. And his voice is perfect for this topic. It is about time, written by an expert on quantum gravity. And there were just so many moments that completely blew my mind in terms of offering me a new framework with which to look at things. The subject matter is very dense, but it's presented in a very accessible and poetic way. I think there's only one equation that's mentioned throughout the entire book, and that's a very simple one. It's a matter of demonstrating time relativity. It's not something that you need to even understand math to grasp. So if you get the chance, if you're looking to have your frickin' mind blown, and if you want to listen to Benedict Cumberbatch's voice for four or five hours, I highly recommend picking up a copy of The Order of Time by Carlo Rovelli. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find out more about my upcoming tour at becomingtour.com, and I am on the social networks like Twitter and Instagram, at Colin is my name. Feel free to say hello. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright. And I will talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.